Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of TCU Talk, back today with another video. And in today's video, I'm going to be giving you a recap of the Pro Tour, all of the meta calls, all of the percentage of the meta for each hero, who won, how they won, and kind of just give you a general recap of the event, as well as talk about the calling that took place in the same weekend. Hopefully give you a little bit of insight in case you missed it, or just give you a good place to get all the information in one digestible spot. But if you're new to the channel, welcome. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hopefully you enjoy your stay. If you're a long staying supporter, thank you so much as always. If you're free to check out the Discord down below, uh, we have over like 530 members. The Discord's growing like insanely. Part of the Miss Fail is coming up. It's going to be a really cool spot to have. You know, this channel is mainly known for Assassin Ninja. So uh, with the Assassin Ninjas both being in the next set, really cool place to start. If you're a long staying supporter and you want to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the channel membership down below as well. We have 23 members in the channel right now. Um, we have an upcoming giveaway here in about a week for another play mat and another card. I uh, have to figure out which ones I want to do for that one, uh, but definitely take a look at that. And But yeah, we'll get right into the video. So this is the Flesh and Blood LS, or the LSS article for the Pro Tour. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's so much information, but they did a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm going to speed go down and let you see how, many, how much information it is. They did a really good job at recapping the entire event, giving you every bit of information you possibly could want. It was just really, really cool. So definitely go check that out. I'll put it in the description down below. But I'm going to give you just a, a good uh, snapshot of what the meta breakdown was with some screenshots. But the key takeaway for this event is I did a, I do I do the Give and Take podcast with DM Armada and Breezy, and we had a special guest last week, Sam O'Byrne on, who casted the event or helped cast the event beside Uber and... Uh, um, all them and it was just one of the questions asked was is this going to be the best pro tour ever and the reason we were asking that question was because of the meta right the meta is so wide open so much fun don't know what hero is going to take it type thing and so there was a lot of you know question of like how good is this pro tour going to be and my answer was no but not because of the meta really because of the narrative right i started watching and my favorite event ever is when pablo pintor um ended up winning the Pro Tour after starting 0-2 and, and then came back to win all 11 rounds after that, get to the top eight and end up taking it on chain. And that was just such an insane event. Like I never thought that would get topped. I really did it. Or I thought it would take something crazy. And I thought in a meta as open as this, you're not gonna see anything like that. Um, I was wrong. This event, I think no one can disagree. No one can debate in my opinion that this final of this Pro Tour, we'll get to it in a second was the best streamed game of flesh and blood that the game has ever had. Bar none, not close. It just was, right? Um, and honestly, like, I was just in awe, but we'll get right into it. So definitely check out this down below after this video if you want to get the full gist of all the information. I'm going to bring up the comments here for a second. Um, and here is the metagame breakdown of the Pro Tour, right? So we had a total of 388 registered players, 76 KO, 52 Jeremiah and it went down the list from there. We'll talk about the things that, that made sense, right? Everyone was expecting Jeremiah and KO to be the top two most represented decks. I honestly thought it was going to be a little bit closer. I thought Jeremiah could get close to eclipsing KO as like the most played deck, but KO is just too naturally powerful. And I think it's a lot easier to, uh, to switch into KO last second or not last second, but you know, in the last month than it is to Jeremiah. It doesn't take as much reps. The deck can kind of pilot itself sometimes. Whereas Jeremiah, you have to have so much knowledge of every matchup in order to pilot the deck efficiently. Um, so I can get why KO is the most represented deck. That made complete sense. Some of the bigger surprises to me, Dorinthia was one of the two, I think, kind of perceived counter decks going into this event. I think from a public level, the most perceived counter deck was Katsu. A lot of people thought Katsu was going to perform really, really well. or were really high on Katsu going into this event. And then on the pro team level, from what you could hear, it seemed like Dorinthia was the number one sleeper pick. Um, whether it was Hatchets, Dawnblade, no one was really saying that much. Ended up being Hatchets. Uh, but Dorinthia ended up being kind of following the narrative of being one of the counter picks being the third most represented deck. I was not expecting her to be that high, but I, I, I honestly expected like her and Katsu to flip, to be honest. But still really awesome seeing her represented that much. 
Then the other surprise to me was Victor. I didn't think people were this high on Victor. I'm assuming maybe it was because of all the Katsu hype going into this event. Not all. I act like that's all the people were talking about. But some of the Katsu hype going into this event, some people might have teched into Victor because of that. And Victor's just naturally a really solid hero, especially over a large event. Um, Azalea being so high was a little bit surprising to me. She does counter KO. She can counter KO, but she does, you know... Kano is kind of a flip, coin flip, and Jeremiah is really, you know, not auto lose by any means, but it's very difficult. And Victor is very difficult. So I was very surprised by that one. Um, going down the list, it all made sense. Kano being an 18 made sense to me. I thought actually Kano would be a little bit more represented, like in the low 20s. Uh, but Kano is very solid deck. Um, Kasai being over Bravo is very interesting to me. I thought Kasai was very risky in this meta. I think Hatchet Strinthia, honestly, is a little bit better because of its matchup into decks like KO and Kano and um, Jeremai and stuff like that. I think it's just a little bit more efficient with those three wide swings. Um, so the rest of the meta didn't really uh, surprise me too much. It was really cool seeing three Arachne in there. Um, four dash IO was a little bit interesting. I didn't expect to even see a dash IO. And we actually saw one Tekla loss, which was really cool. So pretty diverse meta though overall you can't complain again it was the most diverse meta we've ever had going into a big event like this and the meta spread showed for it kind of giving you a more uh detailed look at the percentages right so ko had obviously 20 percent of the day one proportion really really high followed by jeremiah 13 it goes down the line from there jeremiah and ko are the biggest ones when you look at day two conversion obviously draft plays a plays a part of this so keep that in mind the best conversion was technically tech Austin, the one tech Austin converted but if you don't count tech Austin, no disrespect to them you just kind of gotta look at numbers bolton actually had the next best conversion uh nine out of ten boltons made day two uh and then third place was dorinthia actually at 72 percent day two conversion um which is pretty really cool pretty cool uh out of the 29 dorinthias you know you're looking at basically 21 22 of them made day two uh which is really cool and then also uh viscerai uh four out of six viscerai made it and the list goes on and on but ko and uh victor both had pretty good conversion rate jeremiah was just sub 50 um prism was right at 50 so kind of the big winners were like reinar bolton and dorinthia which is really really cool to see again showing that wide mass spread um, there was a couple 7-0 records going into the day. I think the only two were Maximilian and there was a couple. There was Maximilian. I know T ended up being 7-0 as well. Um, there was a Leviya player that was 7-0 as well. So it was really, really cool to see that. But yeah, a pretty wide open meta for the most part, though, to be honest. And this is how the top eight ended up going. So this one, I watched every match. Uh, Daniel and Philippe was pretty nuts um it was a three turn game that ended up lasting like 20 30 minutes uh basically daniel ended up playing like a three a three attack wide turn basically forcing philippe to have the combo because he threatened lethal like he threatened he basically forced philippe's combo turn um and i want to say like the brazilian audience for philippe so much support it was really cool seeing that but philippe ended up doing his combo and Ended up revealing a red off of the Ragamuffins, which not revealing, but seeing a red off the Ragamuffins. He Kano'd, and then in response to Kano, he played uh, Stormshires. Then in response to Stormshires, he played Ragamuffins, um, and he ended up finding a red, sadly. So he couldn't quite combo off like he wanted to. He ended up getting Daniel down to like seven. And then after that, I think Daniel played a... Um, attack that basically was either dominated or forced Philippe to like have the kill that turn and Philippe didn't have it because he drew like three or four reds. So Daniel ended up taking that. It was a really fast game. Daniel also got not lucky. I mean, you get the cards you got, but it really benefited Daniel because on Philippe's combo turn, he, he showed a red off Ragamuffins, which sucked for him. And Daniel ended up having a whole blue to pitch for AB3. So when Philippe played his wildfire, Daniel was able to block half of it, which hurt Daniel's already like suboptimal uh, combo turn. Um, so Daniel ended up taking that. Then we had the Hatchet Dory Mirror. So Hatchet Dory was the story of this event, other than the eventual winner in Dromai. Um, Maximilian and Josh Lau, both on the Hatchet list. It's kind of like this dark horse list that's going around. It was a grinder. I mean, that was an hour-plus game, easy. Max ended up taking it, 
It was a really, really, really close game. Really cool to watch. He ended up doing like a pitch stack blade runner hit and run spill blood turn, like something crazy. Ended up taking it over Josh Lau. Then Joel ended up winning the the, the KO mirror, just them beating each other up. And then finally, Arthur. So I'm not going to go too much in this. I'm just going to say that was the most ballsy, unbelievable Dromai play I have ever seen of any Dromai ever. This guy played three, two KOs into a into a Dorinthia. Both KO matches. This guy, Arthur just kept taking damage where we're like, why is he taking so much damage? He kept taking so much damage. No, he knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. Um, and setting himself up to have these outs to do this crazy, crazy stuff. He basically won both of those games off of like burn them all for the most part. Um, but on both of those games, he got they, the KO went first in both games. And in both games, he got turn one cast bones, right? The KO in one, the KO ended up like playing cast bones. And the second one, the KO discarded a mighty wind up, making a might token, and then played cast bones. So at, at his turn one, uh, Arthur didn't get to filter at all or make ash or do nothing. And the. KO had plus seven go again on his first attack. So just unreal stuff. Um, he was able to battle back. And in both of those games, he took 10 or 13 damage. Their turn one just had to take it to the face. So both games by his turn two, he was down 13 life and ended up coming back and winning. Please go to the Fab TCG YouTube. Watch those games back. Absolutely unbelievable. But he ended up taking it over both those KOs and then getting in the final against Maximilian. Going into this final, Max is a talented player. Max obviously has a game plan to draw my, but I thought it was pretty much over. Like I thought barring some high roll, Max was just kind of cooked. I was wrong. That match was insane. It went down to one life to one life. Um, there was a play line where basically Arthur had a choice. He either blocked. There was a four power ax coming at him and he is at four life. Um, he has a Kyloria in hand, a Chromai, a Burn the Mall, and a Sink Below. So the four power axe coming in, no go again, no nothing, just, you know, Arthur's at four life. Instead of blocking with the Sink, he blocks, or yeah, he had, he, or he had, he's at two life. I apologize, not four, two life. Instead of blocking with the Sink and staying at two life, he blocks with the Kyloria and goes to one. Then he plays the burn them all and Chromai out and plays Chromai, which then puts Maximilian to one. And now Maximilian hats basically dies next turn if he can't kill um, Arthur. Arthur ends up arsling the sink blow, but Maximilian drew in before Arthur plays Chromai, burn them all. Maximilian drew into a spill blood, which meant that even though Arthur was at one and has sink blow and arsenal, He's going to lose if he doesn't draw into a Sigil of Solace because instead of blocking out that four power axe the turn before and being at two, he ended up deciding to go to one so he could conserve and save that sink below for a future hand, which a lot of people in chat were disagreeing with. A lot of people in chat were like, play the play the sink below and then play out Kyloria and to burn them all and then force Max to block like and he would have had no arsenal. If he would have done that, he would have lost the game. But instead, he makes the unconventional line of keeping the sink below. Then Max plays the spill blood and plays the first axe for four. Um, Arthur play blocks with a, I think it was a Kyloria. No, it was a Uvia or something like that. He blocked with a dragon, to, and then played sync to play around the blade flurry because he's like he could still have blade flurry, um, and then sunk a card. So his other three cards, none of them were de like defense reactions or sigils. So he was going to lose next time because Max was able to give the first axe go again with Glint and then was going to swing for five because axes get buffed um, and win the game. The only way Arthur wins the game, the only way he stays alive to then trigger burn them all in his turn is if he sinks a card with sink blow from his arsenal and then draws into a sigil of solace. I don't know if he only had one left in deck. I think he did. And he had around 25 cards in deck. So this guy has a 4% chance, give or take a percentage, to grab this sigil to stay alive and win the game. If he doesn't draw into the sigil, he loses. The most climactic thing ever, he draws into the sigil. He ends up playing Sigil of Solace, staying alive, going to one life, 
and then beating Max with the Burnham All Trigger on his turn, winning the entire Pro Tour. He won the Pro Tour off a blind sink below into the one card in his deck that can beat Max. Unbelievable game by both players. Like, bar none, the best stream Flesh and Blood game ever. Please go back and watch it. I'm not even doing it justice by explaining what happened at the very end. Go watch the whole game because there were so many decisions that were just amazing. It was absolutely unbelievable. Um, that was the Pro Tour. I'm so excited to see what happens. So now Dromai is now at 996 Living Legend points. Her next win period, she is Living Legend. There is one calling prior to Miss Fail's release. There's also another uh, Battle Hardened that will also... Uh, I think there's two or three event. There's one event way before the, the release of or Pro Quest season. Uh, and then there's a calling in a battle hard in the first week of pro quest season but regardless by the second week of april dromai is gone she's going to be living legend um which is pretty nuts to see then we have the calling i won't go too crazy on this because just in the interest of time but as you can see very similar makeup as the as the pro tour a lot of people that dropped in the pro tour probably played their same hero in the calling uh the only other cool thing i wanted to point out there was 13 arachne in this which is really really cool to see i was really excited to see that and 14 uziri um all the all the heroes at the top made sense we saw five riptide four dash io four viscerai three tech of austin three max two olympia just every hero pretty much for the most part i think betsy's the only one i don't see off the top of my head there might be someone else that's not being represented but betsy's the only one i i, I don't see rip um but that was uh the calling this is kind of what it looked like from a visual representation if you want to pause it uh but pretty diverse field and then day two ended up having nine Jeremiah, eight Dorinthia, eight KO. So nine out of the 57 Jeremiah made day two, eight out of the 29 Dorinthia made day two, and eight out of 83 of the KO made day two. Pretty substantial there. Katsu was eight for 35. Um, so on and so forth. Even two Arachne out of the 13 ended up making a day two. One Arachne was six and two, and one was seven and one. And their their lists look pretty are pretty normal from what I heard. So that's really cool. Um but the top eight ended up, Matthew Dilks ended up taking it on Kasai over Majin Bay. So Kasai gets 100 more Living Legend points, um, which is pretty cool to see. I don't know the extent of what happened to Majin Bay. All I know is he posted a tweet, a tweet of saying like, so he does something called story time on his YouTube channel where he like goes over the the event that he just did and he said man i got the greatest story time of all time or whatever and he had an iv in his arm and from what i heard he was like throwing up while playing not necessarily in the final but going into top eight but he kept having to get up to the point where the judge told him like hey i'm not trying to be like an a-hole but this is all second information i haven't confirmed this um if you have to keep going to you know go throw up we're gonna have to disqualify you just for you know because it's not safe right for yourself or people around you um so i think he wasn't feeling his best but matthew dilks took it no no uh no more no less so that's gonna put uh kasai actually at 220 living legend points seven weeks after her release which is pretty crazy um she's doing really well as well so congratulations to matthew dilks for winning the calling and I know Brody Spurlock and Michael Fang ended up being in the final of the Living Legend Battle Harden. Michael Fang ended up taking it on chain over Brody's Lexi Livewire, which is really, really cool. So overall, super awesome event. Um, definitely go check it out. Uh, I'll put the description to the to the whole live blog down below. But let me know what your thoughts were down below. I, this event was amazing. I watched all three days. I was glued to it the whole time. It was super fun. Um uh panage and and sam and uber and brian and, and ethan and all our team and arcane events thank you so much for putting it on thank you so much for james white and uh alex and all them for for you know all the hard work getting into it uh it was really awesome to see and i'm really excited for the upcoming events and the miss fail release but let me know what your thoughts on the comment down below if you like this type of content please leave a like comment or subscribe if not me it's totally fine Go to another Flesh and Bug creator, leave a like, comment, subscribe on their stuff so we can get more people seeing this game. And I'll see you all next time on TCU Talk. Thank you all so much.